Well, good morning. We are in the uh, 23rd chapter of the book of Proverbs, and we are going through the wise sayings. I, uh, I want you to know I consider it a real blessing. I was thinking about this driving down. I couldn't wait to get down here. I said, I've got to get out of this oppressive heat in Oklahoma City uh, to get to Dallas. Uh, but I thought to myself, what a blessing to be able to come uh, to this class again after all these years and to be a part of the ministry of the Word. I'm so grateful to the elders for asking me to do this. Uh, chapter 23, we are at saying number 18 which is verses 26 through 28. Give to me, my son, your heart, and let your eyes, here's an interesting word, delight, uh, pleasure, delight in my ways. Now that final phrase there of the proverb, in my ways, that's the key to the proverb. Uh, for or because it's a, uh, it's a word of explanation. An address, uh, an adulteress is a deep pit and an unfaithful wife is a narrow well. Indeed, she lays an ambush like a robber and increases the traitors among men. Now, saying 19, which is verses 29 through 35, it's a very vivid illustration of alcoholism, the drunkard, but we're going to skip that because we have covered that in previous Proverbs. So we're on to saying number 20, which is uh, a new chapter, chapter 24, verses 1 and 2. Do not envy evil people and do not crave to be with them. Here is another explanation. Because or for their hearts ponder violence and their lips speak malice. Saying 21, which is verses 3 and 4. By wisdom a house is built and by understanding it is established. And by knowledge, its rooms are filled with all kinds of precious wealth. Saying number 22, verses 5 and 6, a wise man prevails by might, and a man of knowledge musters Strength. Very interesting idea there. Surely by guidance you must wage war. Victory is won by many counselors. Well, that's our study this morning. We have, we'll go all the way through 23 and launch into chapter 24 this morning. So here is our exposition beginning with verse 26 and saying number 18. The Father speaking to the Son, because that is what this is. This is the education within the home. And we have to understand the book of Proverbs. That is the domain that we are working from. So this is not evangelism in a stadium or anything like that. This is instruction from the family unit as God would intend it and deliver it to us. So verse 26, chapter 23, give to me, my son, your heart. Uh, most English translations use the word delight. Um, Delight in my ways. It's the 
implication of the observation of a child. We are looking at things from his perspective. So this opening command of the parent is to give, and that's matched by the command of the top line here to delight or take pleasure. They are actually complementary to one another. It is the call for a child to enjoy the spiritual benefits that are provided for him by the wise parent. What the parent is teaching the child is how to walk. And so how did you learn to walk? You didn't uh, one day stand up in your crib and watch mom uh, move across the floor and say, wow, what unbelievable peripatetic action that is. Uh, you, how did you walk? Mom and dad held you up and you took a step and away you went. And then there were two, then there were three, and we're all applauding. And that's how you learn to walk. So that's what's going on here. Um, and so the, the wise parent is teaching the child to walk. Now, the verb to walk in the Old Testament means more than just walking. It means fellowship. And we got that from the man and the woman in the garden walking with the Lord in the cool of the evening. What were they doing? They were having fellowship one with another. So you walk with wise, you become wise. So we have fellowship with one another in that way. And that is the idea here. So the idea of the proverb is the best thing that could ever happen to a child is to be raised in your home. Because you are instructing them in the skill for living. They don't appreciate it now. But they will. Just keep at it. Keep at it. And that explains the second command. Delight. It's a word that Solomon used actually to give us the security, one of the benefits of wisdom. Here's how it's used. Proverbs 3.24 When you lie down, you will not be afraid. When you lie down, your sleep will be sweet. Sweet is our word. Delight. It's one in the same word. Same thing. Now, as I said, here's the key to the proverb. In my ways, the ways of the parent. The ways of the parent. And what is that? Well, Kent Hughes, in his book, excellent book, Disciplines of a Godly Man, he said that all leadership, biblically, is demonstrable. Meaning, you demonstrate it. It's not platitudes. And it's not commands. You know, go out there and get him. That's not leadership. Uh, it's a picture of King Saul. You remember? Uh, he tries to put all this armor on little David, and it doesn't fit, it doesn't work. And David said, you know, just leave me to myself. I'm fine. And here's the picture of Saul's leadership. Uh, standing there surrounded by armed guards in his tent and saying to little David, ah, may the Lord be with you. You know, here you are, mister. You're taller than everybody else. Why aren't you out there facing the giant? But he's not going to face the giant because he's a coward. Here's the king. Here he is. That's demonstration of leadership. And that's what Kent Hughes is talking about there. Second um, Samuel three seven. Uh, the apostles, the apostolic band, when they came to Thessalonica, Paul was reminding them about that. Uh, when we came, 
to Thessalonica, you didn't learn idleness from us. Uh, we got in and worked shoulder to shoulder with you. Uh, we didn't uh, borrow from anybody. We didn't take anybody's food. If we did, we paid for it. Uh, all of this, Paul said, was a demonstration. We could have passed a plate, but we didn't. We didn't because, he said, we wanted to be an example. The word is model. We wanted to model for you what our truth was about, and that bridged the credibility gap. This is who we are. This is what we're about. Here's another one of those demonstrable explanations. The Apostle Paul, 1 Corinthians 11.1. 1. He says, follow me as I follow Christ. Don't listen to what I say. Watch me and do likewise. That's leadership. So let's all be a model, right? And that's for the child in the home. Now, when I was here two weeks ago, someone asked me, they said, well, you know, you were talking about the child outside the home and the child is rebellious, not walking with the Lord. And uh, you talked about uh, some verses, uh, promises. Uh, could you give me a few of those? I said, I will next time. So here they are. Uh, how about this one? 1 Samuel 2.30. And you don't need to turn to 1 Samuel 2.30 because you know it. It's a very famous text. I will honor those that honor me. All right, let's think about that. What's the context of that text? Well, the context is judgment. Judgment on the house of Eli the priest. Because Eli the priest had forfeited the job of being the priest for the family, the family leader. He forfeited it. And God said, now I'm going to judge you for it. And here's how I'm going to do it. You're wiped out of the, king, of the priestly line. Your name will no longer be associated with the priesthood. And your line, your descendants, are going to be gone. That's how I'm going to judge you for what you've done. You dishonored the priesthood to whom much is given, much is required, and therefore I'm taking it away from you. Now that's the context. So, let's talk about being a good parent. What do we do? Child is outside the home. Child is rebellious. The child is not lit on fire like we would want them to be. So what do we do? Well, as the father, the head of the clan in the Old Testament, in his line, we pray and we beseech the Lord. Here's what we do. We honor Him. So the focus is not on them. The focus is on me. It starts with me. I'm going to Get up every day and I'm going to honor the Lord with all my might, with all my strength, with all my heart. That's what I'm going to do. Now, we're in the NFL training camps now. And uh, I've listened to new nomenclature. These new words, um, I'm sure they come from um, sports psychologists. I had a guy introduce himself to me. I said, what do you do? He said, I'm a sports psychologist. Oh, wow. Never seen one of those before. And they use this terminology. And now this terminology is, uh, is now used and bannered about by players and coaches. So here's, here's their terminology. They're not looking for the flash. Okay. What's the flash? Well, I think of a flash of lightning. Okay, so here's the flash. We're not looking for the flash. Uh, that would be the guy that gets up and takes the first pitch and knocks it over the fence and he's hit a home run. That's the flash. He runs out there and catches the ball over the fence, brings it back, and robs a man of a home run. That's the flash. They're not looking for the flash. They're looking for the stack. 
Okay, what's the stack? Well, the stack is you're out there and you're playing, you've got a one handicap, you're playing par golf or one under. And you finish and you say, wow, now I'm going to take this day on the course and I'm going to stack the next day next to it. I'm going to use that as my standard. And I'm going to put all my effort into the next time. And I'm stacking my days like you'd be stacking plates. One stack and we build and we build and we build. So here's the text. 1 Samuel 2.30 I will honor those who honor me. So I'm going to stack that. That's what I thought. I'll just, that's a great idea. I'll just start thinking in that way. I'll start stacking my days. And so I'm going to honor the Lord every day and I'm going to make that my goal. And then I'm going to proceed forward. So that's your promise. Now let me give you another one that locks right into that. And I'm going to come full circle into our proverb. It's... Uh, Psalm 37, verse 4. You don't need to turn there because you know it. You've heard it so many times. And it uses our very word in the proverb. Delight. Delight yourself in the Lord and He will give you the desires of your heart. Now, let's take the last part of that phrase. He will give you the desires of your heart. Now you're praying for that child, right? Outside the home. You're honoring the Lord every day. And now you are delighting in Him. You're making Him your top priority. And what's the residual effect according to Psalm 37 verse 4? You're getting the desires of your heart. You're becoming powerful. Not by what you say, but by the demonstration of your life, the way you live. The buck stops here. It's not, my, oh God, change my child. No, change me. Change me first. It's demonstrable. That's leadership. Here's 27. Because for an adulteress is a deep pit and the unfaithful woman is a narrow well. This opening, because your translation for or for as, both expressions of explanation here. The reason for the young child in the home to trust his heart and to trust his mind in the father and mother's protection that were given to them in the home. This term, adulteress, unchaste wife. Now, I have skipped deliberately Proverbs or the in these wise sayings because I don't want to be redundant over Proverbs that we have carefully uh, looked at before. So why am I addressing this one? Good question. I'm doing it for a specific reason. And here's the reason. There are 65 verses in the book of Proverbs that one way or the other address this unchaste woman, this adulteress. There's more time, there's more attention in the book of Proverbs to her than there is to wisdom itself. As a Bible student, now we immediately start thinking of revelation in proportion. Revelation in proportion. What do I mean? If I've got this many verses stacked up compared to this many verses stacked up, then it's obvious the large amount of verses is what the Lord wants me to get. And I said, okay, I get it. I'll teach it again. This adultery and promiscuity 
is everywhere. It saturates our society. It is not the skill for living. A couple of years ago, uh, Fox News did one of their man on the street segments and they gave people a word and they wanted their first response after hearing the word. And so they said to this young lady, prostitution. And her response is, live your truth. Not wise. Live your truth. Your truth. Not my truth. But hey, it's all relative, right? There's no absolutes, right? Live your truth. So here it is. What do the Proverbs teach? Okay, she's an outsider. She abandons her previous commitments. That's Proverbs 2.17. She forsakes the companion of her youth. She forgets the covenant of her God. Two important words there. She forsakes and she forgets. There's no loyalty with this person. That's the point. The loyalty was in the home. That's the way it was taught. The loyalty was with mom and dad instructing you in the home. They were like the Lord God to Israel. Always showing hesed, covenant faithfulness, above and beyond the call of duty. That's mom and dad. But not this woman. Now you go outside and here you meet her. Now isn't it interesting, as I pointed out when we encountered her, encountered her in the book of Proverbs, that the father took the son by the hand and he walked him right down to her. Or remember, he looked out the window and he propped his son up and he looked through the window down at this wayward, foolish simpleton and watched her take him away. And the Father is teaching the whole time. You see, we learn something really important about the skill for living in teaching the Proverbs. It's not platitudes and it's not instruction on a blackboard. This isn't mathematics. This is the Father taking the Son by the hand and letting Him see. And then, most importantly, the Father does the interpretation. He's interpreting everything. And the Son is all ears because He knows His Father loves Him unconditionally and He's training Him. See, this is what's happening. This is how it happens. So when he gets out of the house and he's in the world and he encounters her, what does he hear? He hears the interpretation that's given to him by the Father. He's not surprised. His first encounter with this woman is not Playboy magazine. No, the Father's already taught him. The Father has educated him. And so now he's got... He's got a drawer full of understanding that he can interpret. That's the book of Proverbs. What wonderful teacher this book is for our children. Now, two figures here. Look at them. The first is the deep pit. That's her home. That's where she lives. That's where she takes the man either physically or psychologically. In my years of walking with the Lord, I have had on very brief occasions had people call me wanting to meet with me and they're in the deep pit. And without any difference whatsoever in these men, all of the experience that I had with them is one and the same. And here it is. They don't know north from south, east from west. 
They are absolutely a mass of contradictions. That's what they are. They couldn't tell you what's right or wrong. They are befuddled and muddled in their minds. So here's what happens. They, um, they cry. They're covered over in guilt. And then the next minute, they've lost their temper. They bang on the table. They point their finger at me and tell me that I'm judging them. They're just extremes. There's no consistency with them. And I point out, listen to what you're saying. Are you listening to what you're saying? And they're not listening. They're emoting. Fellas, I love you. I'm telling you the truth. It's hard to get out of a deep pit. It's hard. Here's the second illustration, the narrow well. That's another comparison. What's the narrow well? Well, they dug these wells in the ancient world, and for whatever reason, the walls of that well become corroded, and it kind of caves in, caves in on itself, and so it blocks the bag that you're dropping down to get the water source from getting to the water. So you drop the bag down and you're thirsty and you come up and there's nothing there. Have you ever been severely dehydrated? I did one time in high school, uh, college, uh, high school athletics. Uh, we don't give people water. Well, that's the dumbest thing you, I ever heard. We now know better, but back then you didn't do it. And uh, I was severely dehydrated. Uh, it, it, here's what happens. You begin to shake. And uh, you become very anxious. Because this body that God gave you is craving liquid. Well, that's what this woman does. She creates anxiety in your life. She creates frustration in your life. There's no peace. And if there's no peace, the, the trips of satisfaction, all you're doing is drag racing down a dead end street. It doesn't get you very far. That's what she delivers. Look, indeed, she lays an ambush like a robber. Further dangers, the expanded application through other images. Here's the first, lays an ambush. Descriptive words, picturing as digging a concealed trap. The top line here is actually a comparison. That's your word like. A direct comparison. And a direct comparison to what? Look, she's a robber. Yeah, a robber. It's a rare Old Testament word. Uh, it's used in Job chapter 9 and verse 12. If he snatches away, who can stop him? Stop him. That's the word. Snatch away. It gives us the idea that her motives and methods are cold and calculating. Even we could say ruthless. She gets those fingernails into you and you can't get free. Look at line two, increases. See, she's effective. She makes the man abandon his loyalty to his own home, his loyalty from the home that he came with, that he was instructed with, and that ultimately affects his loyalty to the living God Himself. Now he's betrayed all of them. The home he came from, the home he's living in, and the home that God had given to him through His Word. Look at this word, traitor and treacherous. 
you have to really analyze the sentence. The traitor and treacherous is the man. Fellas, it's us. We're the traitors. It will be two years, calendar years, in October. And I got the call early, early, early in the morning that a family that I had known very well and been very acquainted with in Oklahoma City, and the father had had a stroke, was put in an ambulance, and on his way to the hospital, he died. And so I went over to meet the wife and talk to her briefly, but really, I knew her attitude. She was stone cold, no emotion, and, but I really wanted to reach out to the children. And so we arranged a time, and I, she called me at 2 o'clock. I showed up at the front door. I'll never forget this experience. I actually walked in, and it was a circle up. Everybody was in a circle. The son was here. The wife was here. Uh, the daughter was here. And there were three relatives. So it was a circle. And after about 15 minutes, it dawned on me. I don't need to be here. Um, nobody wants a word from God. Nobody wants prayer. No, this is a time to vent. This man was an adulterer. Claimed to have a Christian testimony. That's what he claimed. But his Christian testimony never matched his life. I told him that. And uh, the daughter is crying. She's sobbing uncontrollably. And it dawned on me, she's not really crying for the loss of her father. She's crying over her life. She's been married three times. That's what you do, Dad. That's what you do. Serial adulterer. And the son, he married an atheist, and he goes to a Roman Catholic church, and they had Bible study in that living room year after year after year. That's what this man's line produced. A daughter who can't stay married, a son who marries an atheist, and he could care less about the faith. The destruction, the damage of this woman and this man, this serial adulterer. He's the traitor. He betrayed this whole family. And after a you know, apples of gold and setting of silver, when I realized there was not a time for an apt word to be said among this, it was a catharsis. I excused myself, and I left, and I got in the car, and I pulled that mirror down, and I said to myself, don't forget this moment. Don't forget it. This is the debris of a tornado that runs across a city. That's what's left. You are accountable, fathers. Grandfathers, you're still the head of the clan. You are accountable for your family. The buck stops with you. Look at this debris. And it's all on you. Every bit of it's on you. Don't ever talk to me about your wife. And your wife wasn't this. And your wife would No, the buck stops with you. You're the head of the family. Everybody adapts to your name. Take your role. Be a leader for your household. That's the proverb.
you're saying 20, which takes us to chapter 24, verses 1 and 2. The next three sayings are really linked in a sequence of alphabetical order for memory purposes, like our A, B, and C. Well, in the Hebrew alphabet, this would be uh, their three opening letters. So here it is. Do not envy evil people. Do not crave to be with them. The prohibition is do not envy repulsive fools. The proverb assumes a morally topsy-turvy world. Things just aren't the way they're supposed to be. That's the idea here. Uh, in 1980, in the 80s, we had the movie Amadeus. Hope you saw it. If you haven't, you need to see it. It's um, the rivalry between uh, this man, Soleri, played in the movie by Murray Abraham, and then there was Mozart on the other side, played by Tom Hulse. And Soleri is this very serious, astute student of music, very dignified man. And then the first scene that we have with Mozart is he's crawling on his all fours in this elaborate dining room, all the tablecloth and refinery at the top of every table, and he's on his all fours chasing a young lady who's giggling. Mozart is the fool, the undisciplined fool. But he's a musical genius. And that was what Soleri was not. It's the story of the prosperity of the wicked. The mocker gets all the talent. That's kind of the way the world works, isn't it? Mozart the genius. But look at the wisdom here. Do not crave. The word is desire. The fool's companionship. We have no common ground with them whatsoever. Now look, I'm, I appreciate as much as anybody a man who can drive a Formula One race car around a track at 280 miles an hour. Uh, that's amazing to me. And particularly now with the way they locate the cameras holding their steering wheel, you know, and doing that. I mean, that's amazing uh, to see a man blast out of a sand trap as we saw at the British Open uh, a couple of weeks back. Uh, 120, 130 yards and the ball goes into the hole. That's amazing. I love it. But I don't want to be their friend. I don't want their counsel. They don't have anything to offer me. I don't read the magazine articles in which they're on the cover of because they have no wisdom for me. The people that I want to gravitate to are the people that add and contribute to my education that teach me about living and how I need to think and to process and to get myself through this life in a faithful way. So I don't desire their acceptance. I don't desire their approval. I just try to honor the Lord every day and stack my plates. So here's verse 2. Because, a word of explanation, their hearts ponder violence and their lips speak malice. Now, this, uh, this is a wonderful word, ponder. Uh, it's so picturesque for us. Isaiah chapter 31 and verse 4. Uh, it's the growl. That's the word. The growl. It's the growl of a lion. Ponder. So, here's the picture. He's killed the beast. Now he's got these big enormous paws of his. And he's got this 
dead animal between these paws. And he's looking down. And he's growling. That's not a time to want to interview him. You know, just want to get your thoughts. Uh, do you like light meat or dark meat? You don't want to do that. Not this time. No, you want to, you want to be clear. And he's growling. What's he doing? Well, he's pondering. Do I want to start here? Or do I want to start here? Do I want this or do I want that? That's the growl. That's what he does. Well, what does this word tell us about the wicked, the fool? He imagines, he devises. His thinking is all about himself every day. He's consumed with self. It's like the lion was consumed with that animal to eat. He didn't care about tomorrow or next month or the rise in interest rates. He's interested right there. Don't bother him. In every conceivable way, he is living his life daily to disadvantage you and advantage himself. Whether it's out on the highway or on Central Expressway or whether it's in a, a commercial transaction or not. That's the way he thinks. That's the way he processes. Here's saying 21, beginning in verse 3, by wisdom a household is built, and by understanding it's established. The making of a household built, it's by wisdom. Dads, grandfathers, that's it. That's what you're really doing. In goodness and righteousness, you're building into the lives of your family. Spend your time teaching wisdom. What is wisdom? Very simply, Exodus 31.3. It's used of the artisans that built the tabernacle in the wilderness. God gave them wisdom. Great skill. So teach them the skills. The skills for living. Life is not live and learn. Life is learn. Then you can live. That's what you're teaching them. The ability to know right from wrong. And it's established, fixed like an arrow to a string. That little groove in the back of the arrow, there it is. It's locked in. And it's established. When I arrived at Dallas Seminary, I, 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 it's inconceivable for me to think about this. I had been in the faith a little over two years. And here I was, studying for the ministry. And I, I was surrounded by People like Mark and Dan who had grown up in Christian homes, whose father gave them Bibles, who instructed them in the Word. And where'd you come from, Mike? Well, well, you see, well, uh, well, uh, it was kind of like this. Uh, I grew up in a liberal Methodist church and uh, I... I put my blue jeans on underneath my slacks so that I could get out of them quickly. Uh, my mother said, that's very odd. You're a very odd child. That was me. And, uh, <laughs> and here I was. I was surrounded by second, third generation Christians. But you see, they had been faithful followers. They had passed the Word of God down to their sons. That's what you're supposed to do. That's it. And here's verse 4, the second half of the proverb. And by knowledge, its rooms are filled with all kinds of precious wealth. Ah, the figure of a room of wealth, jewels. The word room is inner chambers. And let me give it to you, and you'll never forget it because it occurs at a real neat place. It occurs in Genesis chapter 43 and verse 30. And here's the context of the verse. They, the brothers are coming back to Egypt for the second time. They've run out of food. And so they have to bring baby Benjamin with them. Remember, the, the strong man down in Egypt had required them to bring baby Benjamin. So they bring him. 
And here they are. And Joseph comes and he sees. Now there's all of his brothers. All of his brothers. But very particularly, there is his own brother from his own mother. And you remember what he says to him? He walks up to him. And they introduce him. And he says, God be with you, my son. Were they listening to that? Did they hear that? This is not some dog worshiper sitting on the side of a pyramid somewhere. Did you hear what he said? God be with you, my son. And then guess what happens? Then this word, room. He's so overwhelmed, he runs off to the room, which is an inner chamber in the house. And he weeps. That's this word. So the knowledge of God goes down deep. And here's the application I want to make to you. Gentlemen, men today are always afraid. They're afraid. They're weak. Here's why they're weak, and here's why they're afraid. They have no convictions. No convictions about anything, really. I mean, they pledge allegiance to the flag, and they, they gripe about the government, but they really don't have any real convictions about things. You and I, gentlemen, as heads of our home, are men of conviction. Here's our conviction. This is the line that we're attached to. They stoned the prophets. They killed them. They chased down the apostles and they killed them. That's our line. That's who we're attached to. But men today, they're weak. They're pliable. You threaten them. Well, don't take my comforts away from me. But in the Reformation, the Protestant Reformation, they said, you will either join the Roman church or we're going to burn you at the stake. And they said, light it up. That's the men that we're attached to. Men of conviction. That's the knowledge of God. Next time, we'll finish the Proverbs. Let's pray. Thank You, Father, for our time of study today. Thank You for Your eternal Word. Lord, we're just men of feet of clay. We are so weak. And we are so pliable. And we don't do what You tell us to do. And that's why our families are weak because we're not men of purpose and conviction. We don't honor You as we should. And we are now standing in the midst of the results. Give us Your grace today, starting today, to stack righteousness one day at a time, all for Your glory. In Jesus' name, Amen.